Hello and welcome back to Interpreting India. The beginning of 2020 has been defined by a deadly pandemic, precarious geopolitical relations, a sharply contracting economy, and a rapidly evolving technological landscape. This season, we at Carnegie India are examining many of the challenges and opportunities that India will confront in the coming decade. I'm your host, Shivani Mehta, and this week, we're diving deep into Israel-Palestine conflict and India's role within it. On May 10th, a raid on the Al-Aqsa Mosque by the Israeli police that left hundreds of Palestinians injured quickly cascaded into a war between Israel and Hamas. The violence led to hundreds of casualties in the Gaza Strip and 12 Israeli casualties. A tenuous ceasefire has for now halted the violence, but it is likely that the dynamics between Israel and Palestine have changed significantly. Several analysts have alleged that the violence marks the death knell for the already fragile peace process and the two-state solution. Others point to the growing embrace of more radical solutions to the conflict on both the Israeli and the Palestinian side. In this episode of Interpreting India, we assess some of the broader effects of the conflict. What does it mean for the two-state solution and the peace process? How has the international community and India reacted to the crisis? And finally, what is the likely impact it will have on the future of Arab-Israeli conflict? Joining us for this episode of Interpreting India are Zaha Hassan and Nicholas Blarel. Zaha Hassan is a human rights lawyer and visiting fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Her research focuses on Palestine-Israel peace, the use of international legal mechanisms by political movements, and U.S. foreign policy in the region. Previously, she was the coordinator and senior legal advisor to the Palestinian negotiating team during Palestine's bid for UN membership, and was a member of the Palestinian delegation to quartet-sponsored exploratory talks between 2011 and 2012. She regularly participates in Track 2 peace efforts. Nicholas Blarel is Associate Professor of International Relations at Leiden University in the Netherlands. He studies foreign and security policy making, the politics of power transition in global politics, the politics of migration governance, and the international politics of South Asia. Nicholas studies India's relation with the Middle East and has published the Evolution of India's Israel Policy, Continuity, Change, and Compromise since 1922. Recently, he co-edited the Oxford Handbook of India's National Security. He has previously worked with the French Foreign Ministry's policy planning staff and has been a visiting fellow at various research institutions based in New Delhi, including the Observer Research Foundation, Carnegie India, and the Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis. All right, thank you so much for joining all of us and for taking the time to do this. We are having this conversation against the backdrop of weeks of violent clashes between Israel and Palestine. And Zaha, I was wondering if you could take us through some of the main reasons for this most recent episode of violence. What are the factors that kind of snowballed and led to this eruption, uh, I would say. And has it been different from previous clashes between Israel and Palestine? Thanks so much uh, for having me. Yeah, there are definitely the immediate causes for the current escalation that we saw that culminated in the Hamas and Israel volley um, and the bombardment of Gaza. But there are also the long term uh, the root causes of, of what you're seeing or what you have been seeing. And I'll go, I'll go through, I'll go through both of those first, you know, this whole thing began, uh, in this, in the focal point of Jerusalem, uh, the first day of, of the holy month of Ramadan, we saw is Israel taking actions that seemed rather random and gratuitous in terms of what it was going to produce in terms of a Palestinian reaction. For example, the first day of Ramadan, we saw that the speakers to the Muevans call to prayer cut. During the Easter procession, we saw 
um, Palestinian worshipers being blocked and and brutalized by police and arrested. We saw uh, the Damascus Gate during the month of Ramadan when many people go um, during the Ramadan nights in a very celebratory mood to hang out and be together. We saw the Israeli authorities blocking the plaza in front of the Damascus Gate to prevent that kind of activity. And then, of course, we saw at Sheikh Jarrah, it's um, an occupied East Jerusalem, where there's a a number of families that are facing eviction. We saw settlers um, becoming very aggressive towards the families that are living there and whom they are trying to displace and take over their homes. We saw the the Israeli authorities basically protecting the settlers who uh, over the the uh, residents of of that neighborhood in occupied East Jerusalem. And then, of course, we saw the Israeli police, uh, a really aggressive ham handed tactics against Palestinians in um, inside the uh, esplanade of the Haram Sharif and then into the the Al-Aqsa Mosque with stun grenades and tear gas and rubber coated bullets against worshipers during one of the holiest nights uh, in the holiest month of the Muslim calendar um, in one of the most sacred spaces for Muslims. Um, So all of this was taking place while Hamas, who has marketed itself as the the um, you know the keepers of Jerusalem, the guardians of Jerusalem, as opposed to the Palestinian Authority, which has been completely hands off during all of this, uh, all of these uh, various events during the month of Ramadan, and in fact trying to prevent Palestinian protests in the areas in which the Palestinian Authority has some limited uh, jurisdiction. So Hamas warned it would respond if there was further aggression in in the um, Al-Aqsa Mosque. And there was further aggression in Al-Aqsa Mosque and true to form then Hamas responded with rocket fire. And then from there, we know what happens. Um, The Israeli uh, military then begins its campaign, its bombardment of Gaza, which, you know, we know from past episodes that the Israeli bombardment has has a strategy to it. Whether we're talking about 2008, 2009, 2012, 2014, when we've seen similar bombardments of Gaza, the IDF uh, policy or strategy is is known as the Dahia Doctrine. And this doctrine basically says that Israel will respond to resistance with a disproportionate force against civilian infrastructure and civilian targets as a way to deter future um, action uh, and future resistance from from that territory, from that target. And that's what we see time and again. And that's what we saw this time. Um, What was different about what happened, though, this time around was that there was a sense among Palestinians, particularly coming four years after, I mean, having four years of the Trump administration, that there was nobody that was going to have the Palestinian back, basically, that the Biden administration was given 100 plus days to show its colors, to show whether or not it was going to turn a page on U.S. engagement and be more um, more concerned with human rights and Palestinian, uh, you know, Palestinian claims uh, in uh, the occupied territories and more broadly uh, vis-a-vis Israel. And I think there was a sense among Palestinians that that uh, the the new administration was not going to be any different than previous administrations. And there was a sense um, because of the nature of the Israeli um, attacks in Jerusalem, whether it be in Sheikh Jarrah or whether it be against um, Palestinian presence in the old city or around the old city or um, on these holy sites, there was a sense that this is an ongoing story of displacement and replacement of Palestinian presence in the city with, with Jewish presence. And everyone understands that story if you're Palestinian, whether you're a refugee living outside of the uh, historic Palestine, whether you're a person from Gaza, 70 percent of whom are refugees, if you're a citizen of Israel and you've been displaced like many have and have lost property, their homes and property inside of Israel, 
or whether you're in the occupied territories, you all know what it's like. Palestinians all know what it's like to be, have their homes taken or ha- be under threat of having their homes taken away. And so that was really because of social media, because it was the month of Ramadan, because there was all of this um, this symbolism going on, too. It really resonated among Palestinians more broadly. And you saw a much more coordinated action, more um, more willingness to uh, to protest and to to resist these kinds of tactics by Israel together. Um, And then you saw also uh, an overwhelming amount of support internationally, Uh, again, perhaps because of social media and, and the way in which the news media didn't try to filter as they used to um, the Palestinian narrative um, uh, in their primetime stories. So you saw much more support internationally for Palestinians uh, than you had in the, in the past. So I'm just going to take one point from what you said and turn to Nicholas. Um, there was an overwhelming support from around the world um, as these events were f- unfolding. Um, if I could ask you your views on India's response, um, India's permanent representative at the UN expressed concern over the violence in Jerusalem and the possible eviction process of Palestinian families and warned against attempts to unilaterally change status quo in Jerusalem. Um, He also reiterated India's strong support for the just Palestinian cause and the two-state solution. Um, Would you say India was successful in walking this tightrope of real politic uh, balance? Uh, well, thank you first for having me. And uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I don't, I don't think we can answer uh, is it successful or not. It depends on what you define by success. And uh, and it's still an ongoing situation, I think. And, and as you say, India's position has been um, carefully calibrated. I think carefully, um, uh, I mean, the words have been carefully chosen. I think it's not uh, some decision that has been made by the the permanent U- UN representative that you just quoted at, at the UN on on, on uh, as a, as own is there's probably a lot of back and forth careful back and forth between New Delhi and New York about what exactly to say and this has been the position I think of India I would say since the early 90s when India for, uh, established diplomatic relations with Israel that recognized Israel already in the 1950s 1950 actually and uh, only. Uh, established diplomatic uh, relations and developed good ties with Israel since then. And since then, it has walked this tightrope, as you mentioned, between a, uh, a strong uh, worded uh, support uh, for uh, for, Pal- uh, for Palestine or the PLO, uh, uh, it's more careful in its wording vis-a-vis Hamas, but, uh, and so Yasser Arafat and then Mahmoud Abbas, and, and then this more uh, discreet uh, bilateral relationship with Israel, mostly, conser- uh, mostly uh, uh, defense ties. Uh, but um, over the last, I think, few years, and since the election of Narendra Modi, a much more publicized uh, interaction. So you could have expected in this crisis that India would have taken maybe a more ap- uh, silent kind of position or not have taken strong positions supporting the Palestinian cause or two state reiterating the two state uh, solutions, but actually it maintained this kind of path dependence with its strong uh, support for the Palestinian cause. Um, so in that sense, it's, it, it follows this title of despite expectations that of the, the, the closer relationship between the current uh, BJP government um, and Modi's personal uh, relationship with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. Uh, so in that sense, I think it has been somewhat su- successful, even though you would expect maybe India to take a stronger position in uh, in trying to conciliate positions or to help, help for instance, in the, the brokerage of, of a ceasefire and then maybe negotiations. It hasn't played that active role. It has refrained from doing this. Um, and and yes, has into that it wanted to take a more active role at different times, not in this, um, with this current government. So that's that's why it's still a, a waiting position. That's, it is this, the one thing that India might, you might indirectly term as a uh, successful is that it actually has not uh, satisfied both positions. Uh, there was a, a disappointment from the Netanyahu government. Uh, as you know, there's this famous tweet that is quoted a lot in Delhi about thanking different uh, countries around the world for their uh, steadfast support. And India was not, you didn't see the Indian flag on the on the, on the the Netanyahu tweet, tweet. And it's not clear 
what is the Palestinian authority or Hamas's position on India's uh, careful, carefully calibrated position and change? Some people, have, I, I, as you argue, I think India has reiterated a lot of the statements it's made over the time. Uh, there's a lot of people that uh, see some a subtle shift between its position at the UN Security Council, because India is in temporary position at the UNSC, and its UN General Assembly statements, which there's some slight words in here that are taken out, which might or not mean that it's diluting a little bit its traditional support for uh, the, uh, for Palestinian cause. I think it's we're we're uh, we're uh, we're speculating a lot on a few words. I think it, uh, the, Indian, the Indian government is very careful about what it's saying and about maintaining certain uh, at certain historical positions on this. Um, I did have one question on this India's historic position. Um, now they say that the Modi government has witnessed has sort of witnessed the a stronger relationship between India and Israel uh, that's moved in a positive direction. And uh, even the, the statements that were made at the UN, uh, India was careful not to upset Israeli sensitivities. And one example that is often quoted is that India condemned the airstrikes without naming the Israeli Defense Force directly. Um, in your opinion, could India have taken a more a vocal position at this point, um, or was path dependence the way to go? Well, I mean, it's 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 as as I was as mentioned. It's uh, this is a very interesting point, and actually, I think it's the the, the actual statement is uh, criticizing Hamas's indiscriminate uh, bombing and uh, retaliatory, retaliatory strikes from Israel. So that was the the wording, uh, which might also indicate a slight shift, I think, in in the Indian position uh, or. Just try attempt to carefully um, you know, find a, a middle way and and and, and support the escalation and a ceasefire. Um, and the position of the, the Narendra Modi government that you mentioned, it's it has been a uh, it's been alighted that there's been a rapprochement. Uh, I mean, Narendra Modi was the first Indian prime minister to travel uh, to Tel Aviv. That's already a major, at least public, uh, acknowledgement of a change in the relationship. Uh, I think in the defense. Uh, and also, let's not forget to mention agricultural and um, uh, pharmaceutical and other um, AI technology-based kind of a collaboration. There's been a, lot, a, a, a higher collaboration. I think a lot of it has actually started before the Narendra Modi government. We're putting a lot of credit for the public acknowledgement of the relationship to the, this current BJP government. But a lot of ha has happened in the last 20 years. The formalization or established normalization of diplomatic relations happened on uh, an Indian uh, National Congress government. Uh, or at least coalition directed by the INC, and then it was pursued by the BJP in the late 90s, but also by the late the, the Congress government uh, in the late 2000 and early 2010s. So this is actually a, a bipartisan. At least the rapprochement with uh, with Israel has been a, a bipartisan issue. I, I think you write since 2014. There's been this kind of um, change in the in. Uh, I mean, you can't. It's not a. You can't expect an automatic. Uh, Indian position, kind of a blanket statement every time there's a, there's a, there's a situation, there's a crisis or a situation um, where India has to take a position, right? When it's actually in a multilateral form, when it has to take a position. And it's been very careful to take um, a case by case basis kind of uh, voting strategy. Uh, most of the time, it still aligns with its old traditional uh, positions, supporting the Palestinian cause in multilateral fora, but sometimes it abstains. And that was a new development. It abstains. Uh, it abstained in 2014 when there was um, uh, a decision that had to be made on the on the report, uh, you know, uh, uh, t discussing um, discussing uh, crimes from Israel and and, and Hamas, and then the 2014 uh, cri crisis. So India had voted for the inquiry to happen, but voted against uh, at the UN HRC to vote uh, against the, the the outcome of the report. And so you see this kind of back and forth voting sometimes uh, in favor of, um, of of the Palestinian cause and sometimes uh, abstaining, uh, which sometimes uh, is not well understood in Israel, but often um, um, there's often a, a diplomat, an Israeli diplomat in New Delhi would, uh, would argue this is just doesn't hurt our relation. We have this bilateral relation with de-hyphenated from the position that, that India as maintained vis-a-vis uh, -vis Palestine um, in the in multilateral fora. So this is this uh, kind of uh, uh, tightrope or balancing game that India has kept, and it's actually not not just with uh, with Israel and Palestine. It's between between Israel and Iran, Israel and, uh, and the Gulf states that India has been carefully 
aligning or getting closer to a lot of Middle Eastern actors or West Asian actors over the last uh, over the last decade, uh, before with the Indian National Congress and now under uh, the Narendra Modi government. Uh, so it's 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 a much it's a much more uh, it's not as, uh, as ideological or are 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 uh, dictated by kind of. Uh, personal relationships, as we would have thought, is it's dictated a lot by more pragmatic interest, and this is obviously disappoints some actors that are that were that were uh, that were um, that always looked at India having this principled uh, position since the 1940s, and then in the 1970s has developed very close relations with the PLO uh, over the last uh, two decades. I mean, no discussion is complete without the mention of the two-state solution. Um, so, Zaha. Scholars have previously argued that the two-state solution is the only viable solution that can accommodate interests of both sides. More recently, several analysts have pointed out that the two-state solution is no longer feasible um, given the power asymmetries between Israel and Palestine. Um, what is your take? How would you approach this debate? I wouldn't say that... Um it's the two state solution itself that is unachievable. It's it's any solution in which Palestinian rights and claims are are uh, preserved and protected and incorporated in that durable solution. That's been the issue. It's not because of the nature of the two state solution or or the problems with a one state solution in which, you know, uh, Israeli Jews and Palestinians live together as equals. It's just the very premise of a solution in which Palestinians are entitled to equal dignity that has been failing, um, failing uh, in agreement. So why has this been the case? Um, it's been the case because of the fact, first of all, we, we have to acknowledge that Palestinians are living under occupation and by definition, there is a power asymmetry that exists between Israel and the Palestinians. That means in order to have or get to a, a negotiated solution, um, you, we, we needed a third party player. Uh, and that third party that was selected by both the Palestinians and the Israelis was the United States. Why? On Israel's part, the United States was the preferred mediator because uh, of the relationship, the close relationship that exists with Israel and the fact that the U.S. was willing to put aside international law as the focal point and as the frame for uh, negotiations and was willing to accommodate Israel's settlement expansion and its um, and its positions vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. It was much more sympathetic than any other uh, international player that was still bound by international law and the parameters um, that existing within international law for peace. On the Palestinian side, it, the U.S. was the preferred mediator because of the simple fact that it could deliver Israel and that it, because of its influence over that party. But over the last 30 years, what we've seen is that because of the fact that um, the U.S., put aside international law and was willing to accommodate Israeli positions, we saw um, Israeli settlement expansion quadruple over that period of time, because in order to get Israel to the negotiating table, the U.S. basically had to commit to uh, providing it political cover and in international fora and, uh, you know, accommodating it through the preferred parameters for peace, which incentivized Israel prolonging the negotiations process to allow it to continue to create facts on the ground, uh, which ultimately forecloses a two state solution. Uh, and that's where we are today. And on the Palestinian side, the kind the U.S. engagement basically did the opposite of what it was intending to do. It was intending to create, um, you know, to help uh, bring about a Palestinian state to develop uh, the Palestinian institutions to promote Palestinian democracy. But during that process, because it tried to limit Palestinian agency and Palestinian choice with respect to who could be part of a Palestinian government and, were, and with respect to the ways Palestinians could protect their interests in international fora like the UN, like the International Criminal Court, the US ultimately 
work to delegitimize the Palestinian national bodies with their own people, which foreclosed the ability of Palestinian leaders to actually sign an agreement with Israel. Because if you aren't perceived as legitimate by your own people, you have no authority to sign an agreement. And that basically undermined the ability for a negotiated solution. So today we're at this point now where we have in Israeli uh, politics, a a very right-wing government, and it's trending to go further and further to the right. We have now groups associated with um, uh, Jewish supremacy uh, organizations that have been designated by the US as terror organizations now sitting in the Knesset. And on the Palestinian side, we have a Palestinian authority that is very autocratic, that is illiberal, that is you know, basically standing in the way of elections because of the fear it will lose those elections. And so how do we get back to a place in which we can change these negative trajectories and possibly create the kind of environment we would need to get to a durable solution, whether that's a durable two-state solution or a durable one-state solution where everyone has equal rights um, and equal dignity before the law. In order to get back to that place, we need to go back to basics. The basics are international law and human rights. And that's basically what the Carnegie Endowment uh, paper that was co-authored with the U.S. Middle East Project is advocating for. It's basically saying that as Israel continues to take steps to foreclose a two-state solution, it continues to build and um, solidify its sovereignty over the uh, occupied West Bank and continues to fragment the Palestinian people in enclaves, including in Gaza, then the only U.S. position that uh, that is acceptable will be one in which uh, it demands of Israel the extension of equal rights to all of the people living between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River. And so basically we say that four things need to happen with respect to the U.S. engagement because the U.S. is the principal player, um, principal mediator here. And and first is to to clarify those expectations, basically saying that, you know, the U.S. um, will only only accept a solution that that uh, guarantees the rights and dignity of all people. Um, So centering rights and human security first should be a priority with the U.S. Second, we say that international law needs to become the the um, uh, guiding principles behind U.S. policy. And there needs to be a rollback of the Trump administration's actions and uh, peace to prosperity plan in its entirety. No cherry picking. We can't say, oh, we like this one. We're going to keep this thing that Trump did, but we don't like this other stuff because we need to be consistent. And that's been the problem with U.S. engagement is it hasn't been consistent. It said one thing, It supports a two state solution, but it's done quite something else with respect to its policies on the ground. And third, we need to clarify our positions with the Israelis and the Palestinians. So we need to tell Israel, these are our expectations with respect to your conduct. If you don't meet those expectations, we will use the levers of U.S. power to um, to try to guide you back. So that means no more protection at the U.N. Security Council, no more uh, trying to prevent Uh, the International Criminal Court from, uh, you know, uh, pursuing accountability against Israeli officials for for war crimes. And on the Palestinian side, it means that we will expect from you, uh, Palestinian Authority, uh, democratic governance, and we will demand accountability so long as we provide you with security assistance, so long as we are engaged with you in bilateral relations. And then the the fourth thing we say is that the U.S. needs to start working collaboratively with U.N. mechanisms and um, strengthening those mechanisms so that they can support Palestinian-Israeli peace. What we've seen over the years is the U.S. trying to block um, multilateral uh, efforts towards a, uh, you know, rights centered approach. And so we say that the U.S. policy has to change in this regard, especially given the uh, the emphasis that this Trump or this Biden administration has placed on the rules based international order and on rights. If you look at its interim national security uh, strategy paper, you will see the word values um, on every single page of that document with respect to how the U.S. wants to engage uh, proactively uh, in the world. And so we say 
Israel, Palestine cannot be the exception to that. The more that you make it the exception, the more you will undermine your efforts in this regard. That is why you saw China as one of the principal actors at the UN uh, pursuing a ceasefire. Was it because that it was so concerned with Palestinian rights uh, that it wanted to pursue the ceasefire? No, it was because as the U.S. was talking about genocide and the Uyghurs, it wanted to show the U.S. that you're you're being hypocritical in your approach. And so we say that this is not just good policy towards Israelis and Palestinians. This is good policy for the U.S. to pursue for its larger overall interests in the in the region and in the world. Um, I'm, I'm so glad you brought up the rice rights-based approach um, because, again, Nicholas also kind of shares some of those views. And in one of your papers, Nicholas, you've argued that the U.S. factor in the India-Israel relationship has never been consistent. Um, And I'm quoting directly from it. Has evolved over time depending on personalities, uh, political constellations in power in India and regional developments in West Asia, end quote. So how do you think the Biden administration's approach to foreign policy will influence India's equation with Israel? And do you sense a continuation from the Obama administration or is there going to be some kind of divergence? I think I think India, for its part, as uh, you know, you're going to be a lot of um, criticism about not being public enough in certain parts, uh, certain during certain crises or in certain situations. India has often tried not to be too in, uh, involved into uh, West Asian or Middle Eastern uh, disputes be- or conflicts because it's, uh, it doesn't want to stretch, uh, to be overstretched basically uh, as it deals with own internal or neighborhood issues. But it has been consistent in reminding certain uh, elements of the inter- international law over time. And that's Congress or BJP government. Um, so you, you you have to dissociate a little bit the kind of uh, rhetoric when Modi goes to visit Israel and what is actually discussed in a lot of the multilateral fora, whether it's the UN HRC, uh, UN General Assembly, or even at UNESCO for that matter. So, and again, uh, India is not, despite also uh, closer maybe the personal ties between Modi and uh, and President Trump, India has not supported uh, many of the the U.S. initiatives under the Trump administration in the Middle East. So, uh, except maybe for the Abraham Accords, um, but for the uh, for the, uh, the 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 move of the embassy to uh, to, to Jerusalem, for instance, uh, India was in strong opposition along with other uh, other emerging powers. So on, on US US in US India have not always been on the same line on, 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 on the on the region and historically actually they've been completely in diverging position. India has been uh, stead has had a steadfast support for the PLO since it became re- rep, uh, to be known as this, you know uh, as uh, the sole representative of the Palestinian people. At least it recognized it so in mid 1970. So it, is, it has been on um, on the op- on the other side of the, the of that debate for a long time, and it's made. But what where you see this, do see a side of uh, convergence, and when India also got closer with Israel is maybe also because of the um, the, the peace process and uh, and in India t- taking that opportunity to establish uh, uh, diplomatic relations uh, with is or establishing uh, for formal diplomatic relations with Israel, and one of the reasons at the time it did so, it's not just uh, exploiting a little bit in the in, uh, the uh, the events in the Middle East where the Arab, uh, the Arab states were divided following the Gulf War. Uh, the IPLO's own position had been uh, weakened because of its support for Saddam Hussein. And But India also wanted to get closer to the U.S. So actually, a lot of the uh, discussion that uh, the, the Garaj Gandhi government had with the U.S. in the 1980s was that he, one of the stumbling blocks to have better trade relations or other types of relations was to normalize the, the relations with Israel. It was mentioned uh, to Rajiv Gandhi many times uh, when he visited uh, Washington. So uh, so that's uh, one thing that uh, not the, the Nari Samaro Rao government in the early 90s uh, uh, basically highlighted as one of the reasons for establishing diplomatic relations. Uh, with Israel. Uh, so the U.S. factor has always uh, been uh, strongly present. And actually, oh, even the defense ties, um, it, the, the, you couldn't uh, elevate the kind of technological um, you know, uh, relations when it comes to high technological kind of um, items between uh, defense items between India and Israel, you needed some degree of U.S. approval. So, the, so that's also um, one thing that the 
the, the Indian government and especially the BJP government earlier 2000s was looking towards Washington is kind of in a, getting support to develop better tie, defense ties with Israel. Uh, so, for instance, there's this famous story of the Falcon deal, which was um, um, uh, early airborne uh, basically system that was initially to be sold to China by Israel and the U.S. vetoed it uh, because of it, uh, because of the competitive nature of its relationship with China. But it, it four years later, acknowledged and allowed the sale, the sale of the same technology to India because the Bush administration's own relation with India had improved uh, dram- drastically. So again, yes, I think it's a triangle where uh, you, you're going to see uh, this fluctuation of, of, of better ties with the U.S. and facilitating better ties with Israel and, and vice versa. Uh, the relationship with Israel improve also India's standing and, and influence and, uh, and leverage when it comes to relations with the U.S. So you're right on that point. But it never impacted too much India's position, I think, on, 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 on Palestine, on the Palestinian cause in multilateral fora. Uh, until maybe recently, where is this more uh, calibrated stance uh, since the Narendra Modi government came to power? Probably uh, we could spend some more time talking about Hamas. Um, so Zaha, if I could turn to you first. Um, the main organization that seems to have championed the Palestinian interests uh, by opposing Israel's actions in Jerusalem is Hamas. Um, what does this narrative surrounding Hamas indicate for the Palestinian Authority, uh, given the recent decision to postpone elections in the West Bank? I mean, there's no doubt that Hamas came out of this latest episode of high intensity violence with Israel as the winner here. And that's precisely because of the way in which the Palestinian Authority has been cast and has been operating um, as a security guarantor for Israel in uh, the occupied West Bank the way in which it has appeared to be subservient to the U.S. uh, will with respect to negotiations and the way in which it um, coming out of the 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 Trump administration years has um, tried very hard to accommodate the U.S. and to appear like the good peace partner. The, The Palestinian Authority for some years now has Um, been delegitimized. Um, And I think this latest episode with the elections, all of the the hoopla around the the first Palestinian elections to take place in 15 years, the the excitement with which Palestinians approach this, Palestinians in the occupied territories approach this with 93 percent of the electorate registered to to vote, um, many of whom are young people who have only known the Oslo years and have never been able to vote. Uh, this was an opportunity for them to express their um, their frustration, their displeasure with um, the Palestinian Authority and its ability to deliver a better life for, for them, a life where they could think about having meaningful jobs and freedom of movement and um, some dignity. So when you so when we got to this moment in Jerusalem where you where we had, um, you know, Israeli authorities really limiting the space within within which Palestinians could exert their identity, could could, um, you know, feel secure in their residency when we had all of the the threats to that um, and and a not only a, a, a muted Palestinian response, but a Palestinian effort to to pull back demonstrators in the areas in which the Palestinian Palestinian Authority has some jurisdiction. It really um, drove home for Palestinians living in the occupied territories that the Palestinian Authority has become part of the problem. Um, And there was a great sense of, uh, even for those who, for whom Hamas is not the answer, but there was a sense that, you know, there is there is some Palestinian agency. There is some Palestinian resistance um, and willingness to to fight, whatever that looks like. Um, uh, and so that's why there was great support for Hamas's uh, um, rocket fire to Israel. Um, it was it was more of that some symbolism of that than it was really 
the knowledge that that was going to actually produce um, a betterment of their situation. It was the idea that only through some kind of violent reaction will the world stop and take notice and understand that this situation cannot stand. So you had a lot of Palestinian support for that. You saw Hamas flags flying in Jerusalem, which you didn't see in the past. You saw images of um, Hamas leaders um, draped over um, structures inside the Haram al-Sharif Esplanade, which you hadn't seen that in the past. And you saw when the imam of the um, the Masjid al-Aqsa during the Friday prayers, when he didn't mention uh, what the, the bombardment of Gaza, when he didn't mention the lives that had been lost there, how how the worshipers really responded and forced him down from the pulpit because of because of that. So there is this there is this um, sense of support for resistance more than necessarily support for Hamas itself. But but of course, because Hamas has marketed itself as the only movement willing to uh, resist and and engage with Israel um, towards Palestinian national uh, national aspirations, it's really further undermine the Palestinian authority because the only the only basis for the Palestinian authority was because of the fact it was going to achieve peace <laughs> and because it was going to get to take Palestinians from occupation to statehood. Now, if that isn't in the offing, if Palestinian uh, self-determination in a state of their own isn't in the offing, then the idea that a Palestinian authority should exist as it presently is, um, is uh, as it presently is at the moment is completely undermined. And so the question then is, you know, what, what will the Palestinian authority do now? Will it, um, you know, it's, it's now uh, busy with the U S trying to think about reconstruction for Gaza and trying to leverage it's it's uh, relationship with the U.S. to uh, establish its relevancy in, in terms of the reconstruction of Gaza. But, you know, reconstruction efforts in Gaza have now become regularized and repetitive in nature. And for many people, that's not enough of a reason for the PA to exist. It, it's only perpetuating the um, isolation of Gaza and perpetuating uh, this dysfunctional situation in which we have every few years another another crisis, another um, bombardment of Gaza and, and you know, death and destruction that has become really intolerable for not just the Palestinian people, but for the for the rest of the world watching. I mean, we have never seen the New York Times in the U.S. publish the names and faces of those killed, particularly the, the young people killed um, in, a, in a bombardment uh, of Gaza. So we're starting to see even like, you know, time honored institutions in the U.S. coming out and saying, you know, this is enough. Enough is enough. Now, if the Palestinian Authority isn't going to to also be on that same, you know, on that same uh, wavelength as the rest of the world, then it's its days really are numbered because uh, it's it's really um, out of step with the people. It's out of step with the moment that we're in at the at the present time. And and Hamas can only can only benefit from that. And so it behooves the Palestinian Authority to really rethink its own reason for being and um, and to really think about how it can restore some legitimacy and retool itself to to make it relevant for its people, Um, because right now it's, you know, it's it's receding as Hamas has, um, you know, has established itself as as uh, as the only movement, the only faction uh, willing to stand up to Israel. So, I mean, it's quite obvious um, that the Palestinian Authority needs to kind of take a step back and um, you know, figure out what it needs to do next. And uh, while on the ground, there is a clear understanding of the difference between the objectives of Hamas as well as the Palestinian Authority and what both of these organizations can achieve um, for the Palestinian cause. Um, Nicholas, do you think 
India is also able to gauge this difference? And how does it view Hamas? Because its equation with Palestine is, is fairly well recorded. But um, do we get deeper into understanding Hamas better? Well, um, India's own relation uh, of various governments with, with Hamas has been a little bit complicated. Um, and India's really, I mean, uh, let's, I'm, I'm going to just go back a little bit in history and India's relation with the, the Palestine uh, movement. I think uh, you can trace back India's support to the Palestinian cause to pre-independence. It's well documented. Uh, there was entanglements basically even between the national movements in India uh, and Pakistan, actually, the Muslim League is also influencing uh, Nehru, uh, the Prime Minister Nehru's own thinking about the, the question. Um, and India was part of the uh, the UN Special Committee on Palestine and voted actually the minority plan. They voted for uh, a, a federal uh, state with uh, minority uh, rights for the for the for the Jewish um, population. So, um, and then after that, there was still there was a, the creation of Israel. And India actually did not support immediately um, the different Palestinian um, uh, entities that were uh, that were uh, recognized uh, by some members of the international community. So the old Palestine government, India, had its own also uh, did not recognize. So the APG did not also have uh, had complicated relation with Mufti Ustain. It was closer to 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 the to the new Pakistani government, for instance. Uh, it's only in the 1970s that India develops uh, a relation in, uh, with the PLO and especially with Yasser Arafat. And since then, India, because it, it, it viewed this as a secular organization that was closer to its own views on 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 on, on the on the state nation or or a nation state or state nation writer, right? So uh, the kind of its own view of uh, of the of what should be. Um, which project should lead to the, the creation of a state? So again, uh, it adds uh, better relation with the the, the PLO. It, yes, Arafat was always reckoned as an head of state uh, in in India. A very good relation with Indira Gandhi and then Rajiv Gandhi, and India. But then India put all its uh, diplomatic uh, kind of support on the PLO and was a little bit um, uh, taken in a different uh, was in a complicated situation in the post Arafat. And the post January uh, 20, 2006 uh, period after the elections, it, had very, it didn't have, it didn't have developed, hadn't developed a relation with Hamas and never really recognized it um, uh, as an entity with whom, with whom to establish uh, the relation. So there has been since 2006, because there's been this tendency to note that maybe it's it's a strong support of the Palestinian Authority, but as as I said, it's maybe, um, maybe not as representative or not, uh, not as um, influential as it used to be. So uh, there was attempts in informal ways to establish, to talk to Hamas and to talk to Hamas representative, but never completely publicly uh, recognized or uh, didn't, it didn't develop into long-term sustained relations. So it is in a situation now where it's, it's, it shows India is very, uh, wants to very uh, publicly show that it supports um the Palestinian Authority it always uh, mentions it's one of the main donors to the Palestinian Authority. It still is uh, since uh, the 1940s one of the uh, important donors to the UN uh, United Nations Relief uh, for, uh, of Aid uh, Works Agency uh, for the Palestine refugees uh, in the Near East. So I mean, it always boasts those credentials that it always supported at least Palestinian refugees and to some degree also. Uh, the PLO afterwards, but it has obviously very complicated uh, ties with Hamas for various uh, reasons. And uh, it, I think under the Modi government, it's become even more complicated, I think, uh, to develop relations with uh, with Hamas. And that's why you see these uh, very strong uh, statements criticizing uh, uh, the Hamas uh, rocket, rocket fires against uh, against Tel Aviv. And so um, I don't I do not expect an immediate uh, change in that. I think it will still uh, try to uh, to support uh, Fatah, um, Amun Abbas, and the and PLO, um, but um, yeah. So, I, but will that impact its its own uh, possible uh, broker kind of situation that some are, have been asking for? So, the representative of the Palestinian Authority in New Delhi says that's actually it's it's a, it could be a notice broker because it has good relations with both Israel and the Palestinian Authority. But then, you know, where does Hamas come in in that calculation? So, I don't at this point I don't see an immediate role of India because of that uh, because of that complicated relations with uh, with other uh, entities in the Palestinian. A cause beyond uh, beyond the Palestinian Authority. I'll then just move to the last question, which is for both of you. Given the 
moment in time that we are in right now, where do you see the Arab-Israel conflict going forward? And who do you think US, India, what more can these players do to improve this relationship? I guess I'll jump in first with the US. Um, you know, the, the new administration came into office with the expectation that they were not going to engage very heavily on Israel-Palestine peacemaking, if at all. There was an interest in just restoring some bilateral relations and aid for Palestinians, but recognizing that the conditions on the ground, both in Israeli politics and in Palestinian politics, were not conducive to relaunching any grand uh, peace initiative. Um, and so that was sort of the intention. And the intention was to move forward with Arab normalization with Israel. There was a strong interest in pursuing that and integrating Israel into the region and normalizing its presence among, um, you know, the Arab countries around it. I think um, its plans have been upended quite a bit by the latest escalation between, um, you know, not just between Hamas and Israel, but the larger escalation, both within Israeli um, society with Palestinian citizens of Israel uh, joining their brethren across the green line in protests and really experiencing the same kind of heavy handedness and brutality by Israeli police as you know, it was encountered in Jerusalem and as is encountered by the Israeli uh, by the Palestinians inside the occupied territories at the hands of Israeli um, military. Um, so. Things have, have changed within the, the Palestinian community in terms of the coordination and organizing and the sense of connectedness and common struggle that didn't exist in the past. And so the U.S. Uh, response is going to also have to be reconsidered in terms of how do you deal now with a situation where you're not just talking about you know, Palestinians in the occupied territories, but you're also talking about Israel's relationship to its own citizens. And what does that mean for U.S. policy that has really seen the Israeli-Palestinian issue as a 1967 issue rather than a 1948 issue? So that's that's got to impact U.S. policy because I don't see, um, while you might see a Hamas-Israel ceasefire, I don't see a de-escalation in terms of the sentiment that you're seeing across various fragmented Palestinian communities at the present time, particularly inside of Israel. Um, what does all of this mean for the U.S. effort towards normalization um, in the Arab world with Israel? It's going to be extremely difficult for the U.S. to pursue the crown jewel of normalization, which is uh, normalization with Saudi Arabia um, and Israel. Saudi Arabia, unlike the UAE, is the, you know, the custodian of the two most holy sites for, for Muslims. And you saw across the Arab world, regardless of how um, the authorities tried to clamp it down, but you saw across the Arab world, um, Arabs rising up in support of Palestinians and um, feeling very much um, that, you know, the, the Israeli uh, uh, reaction and brutality towards Palestinians, particularly in the Haram al-Sharif and the Al-Aqsa Mosque was, um, you know, a, a violation of Muslim rights, a violation of um, Arab identity and, and Arab presence in uh, in uh, historic Palestine, uh, in particular in Jerusalem. So uh, it's going to be very difficult for the Saudi, Saudi Arabia to just think that it could move forward uh, openly and proudly as the UAE has done um, in normalizing its relations. And similarly for the other Arab uh, countries, even that those have, that have already normalized um, or in the process of normalizing to the extent to which they can completely um, develop warm relations with Israel, a pe you know, people to people relations with Israel is, is really going to be complicated now by what has taken place. The images of the police storming the Al-Aqsa, you know, were played throughout the Arab world and, um, and they're not going to be so easily forgotten in the, in the near term. So I think that 
that agenda item for the U.S. administration is is not um, is not going to be uh, as easily pursued um, as it as they might have thought uh, coming in uh, coming into office. Um, but I do think that there's going to have to be a, a reevaluation of the approach taken to Israel Palestine, and and it's going to have to bump up the priority list a bit more. Whether that translates into uh, bringing somebody on as a special envoy for Israel Palestine, or whether that means more engagement from the very top level of um, uh, of the uh, Department of State remains to be seen. But I definitely think um, what happens uh, in the last uh, month or so is is really going to change uh, U.S. calculations moving forward. Um. So, yeah, to to talk about the, the looking uh, looking forward, and um, I mean, I think maybe we I'll again go back uh, because I think about a, almost a hundred years ago, in the at least the India with uh, the Indian nationalist movements first took a position on the on, on the issue in, in Palestine. It was the first uh, first resolution by an Indian National Congress. So, I, what I, what I think is important to note is that Indian Indian there's always been an Indian uh, public interest in the issues happening in uh, in the Middle East and especially in Palestine, and strong interest of, for instance, India's Muslim community about what was about what was happening. And, you know, because the, the reason the Indian National Congress took a position is in the midst of the uh, caliphate movement uh, mobilization about what would become of the, the Ottoman Empire after um, and then you know, British control of the, the Palestine of uh, Palestine territory. And, you know, so there was also a link between after that, between India uh, fighting for its own independence and looking also at what was going on in Palestine, a similar struggle against uh, British rule. Uh, so there's been always been these links between uh, disentanglements between the different nationalist movements and projects. And I mentioned uh, briefly what, what happened during at the UN in 47, 48. But there's always been since then an interest. One of the reasons that the new government and then pre, uh, other governments in India uh, had a very strong position pro Palestine and, and also uh, delayed normalizing ties with Israel for so long is was an, uh, basically an, uh, a perception that it would hurt uh, the, uh, the, uh, the it, it would be against basically the uh, the the interest or the um, uh, the sympathy that Indian Muslims add towards the Palestinian cause so it would uh, basically it was a, a kind of a perception that uh, certain uh, a change in India's foreign policy stance could could hurt this uh, this sentiment now the question is what you saw over the last few uh, years is uh, a change maybe in the public mood in India, especially uh, for a very strong vocal, especially with social media supporters in India of actually Israel and Israel's defense against uh, aggression, et cetera. You see these kind of uh, social media hashtags and Twitter coming a lot from, uh, from uh, the Indian civil society. I have a hard time understanding our, wanting to quantify, are we moving from a, a mass kind of a pro-Palestine uh, kind of sentiment within India, beyond India's Muslim community, to now a massive pro-Israel uh, pro, uh, or pro-Likud kind of sentiment, pro-Netanyahu sentiment that we've seen over the last few decades. I mean, we're talking about vocal uh, supporters on in social media, but definitely something has changed. The, the, the debate is a little bit more... Uh, is a little bit more um, divisive in India than it was, I think, in the, in the pre 19th period. So, how does that influence India's own position? Uh, whether it is the BJP government or another government, uh, will will also be interesting to follow. Uh, especially because there's always this impression that you know what happens in in Israel Palestine has has also an impact on India's own domestic uh, domestic polity and other domestic the communal uh, relations, um, and that hasn't gone away. Whether it's exaggerated uh, or not, it's still there, present in the thinking of the Minister of External Affairs, and also maybe to to some degree in the Indian government. And after that, there's the complexity also uh, that Zai was mentioning about, I think I was talking about India's maybe lack of recognition of the more complex uh, political um, landscape there is in, within uh, the Palestinian uh, territories or Palestinian nationalism. Uh, um, and uh, and also, I think I, I would argue a, a very uh, thin understanding also of the complex political landscape there is in Israel. Uh, the the close rapprochement between Modi and Netanyahu is, I think, a little bit short-sighted, given you know the the fluid developments there are also in Israeli politics. 
So I think that's that's also something India has to come to grasp with is that you shouldn't. India has always been uh, is always, has always uh, been guilty of doing this is putting a lot of eggs in one basket when it comes to Middle East politics, and not understanding that the situation can be more fluid. And actually, if it wants to have an impact, and if it wants to play this kind of mediating role that the U.S. Uh, uh, has maybe lost some legitimacy in trying. Uh, in trying to uh, to implement over the last few years, it has to be more compl- more understanding and have a better inf- uh, informed kind of uh, understanding of the, the changing politics in the region. Um, so I think that's important because I do think that there's a perception, that not just in Israel Palestine, but also in the Middle, Middle East more generally, of a gradual disengagement, maybe either uh, real or not, uh, but there's a perception of a disengagement of the U.S. and that the U.S. Has maybe has lost a little bit of its legitimacy as as a honest broker when it comes to Israel and Palestine. So there's been a growing engagement, not just from India, but also China and other uh, emerging powers making more and more public statements about the situation in the Middle East. So could there actually be, we talked about the US, we talked about the quartet, could there actually be other actors other emerging powers that could also play a role now in trying to 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 support de-escalation first and maybe uh, other negotiations. I think we're still too early, and I think uh, a lot of the Chinese and Indian statements are made a lot for signaling in the region rather than actually engaging in a sustained and institutional fashion in the region. But this is maybe a possibility in the future if India gets uh, if India breaks from kind of this uh, this these uh, these past inhibitions it had about being a more more active act, act uh, participate, a uh, uh, more active participant in, in, uh, in regional disputes. I would have loved to go on, but um, that's all we have time for. Thank you, Zaha. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, this has been an enriching conversation. I think we were able to cover a lot of um, space. We broke down current events, went back in history, um, took a closer look at US and India in the region. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much uh, for having me. We'll be back in two weeks with a new episode. To make sure you don't miss it, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. To learn more about our research and team, you can visit us at carnegieindia.org. You can also find us on social media on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thank you for listening. See you next time.